So good day. We now discuss our first lesson in the ATO Fundamentals of International Business, International Business and Globalization. So for the objective of this lesson, here are our various objectives. So be able to know the definitions, domains, the distinguishing features of international business. Understand what is meant by the term globalization. Recognize the main drivers of globalization. Describe the changing nature of global economy. Explain the main arguments in the debate over the impact of globalization. And of course, understand how the process of globalization is creating opportunities and challenges for business managers. So why is it it's important for us to understand international business and trade. So first, international trade, investment, and assets are growing faster than the world output. Globalize, that's globalizing world economy creates opportunities for those with knowledge and strategy. Those with skills to implement global strategies will improve their job and career prospects. So technically, um, it's important for you to know this international business and trade because your competition, not only if you're going to have your business or, or perhaps working, if you want to work in another country, you have to be at par with, what, with the skills of those employees outside of this country. So as you can see here in... in the figure, figure 1.1, growth of global business. This is adapted from the World Investment Report in 2014. It has really, really grown um, in huge percentage for quite some time. So for um, giving you the somehow a brief history of the phases of globalization and the world economy. So the, the first phase actually occurred during 1830 to 1880, where in trade and the British Empire, they were so famous during that time, started with ocean transport already. Railroads, they already have um, starting built, building railroads, and of course, trading companies. So there was already globalization. So globalization during that time, even if the world globalization is not yet coined and international trade is already happening between two countries or various countries because there are already ocean transport. The next phase is during the 1900s until 1945. So the international corporation so this is where the start of electricity is discovered, steel as means and ways to make um, gadgets and machineries, and then the, the European and the US MNE, so multinational enterprises has already start growing and creating business, not only in their domain country, but also outside of their country. And then the third phase, is during 1948 to 1970. So somehow this is um, the end of World War II. So here, um, GATT and WTO, where, where I'm going to elaborate later, Marshall Plans, Rise of Japan, and other brands has been famous, starting to get famous around the world. And then the fourth phase is during the 1980 up to the present. So this is this has started after the end of Cold War. So it happens privatization. Actually, the Philippines was included um, during this privatization of public company, ICTs, the rise of China. So the rise of China when they opened up their economy to the world and ended their communist regime regime they have been really really famous in the market and globalization has been their family name probably because they really really are 
famous all over the world and a lot of businesses are outsourcing to China and of course the emerge and emerging of market so the European market the Asian market the US market and the likes um, according to Bremer in 2014 we have entered another phase of globalization in the aftermath of the global recession so that happens during 2008-2009, global recession. And then this phase is, he called it, guarded globalization, suggesting that governments of developing nations have become wary of opening more industries to multinational enterprises, and they are zealously protecting local interests. So this is also true. That's why you can, you can actually um, see or hear over the news or probably read over the newspapers wherein our taxes are have been changed there have been tax reforms to protect to protect the local businesses of the country anyways i'm going to discuss and elaborate this this the somehow the challenges of globalization but that's one thing um globalization also has its own challenges. And one of that is some of the local industries will collapse because cheaper and the same quality of imported products are present in the market. And there are some terms that you should also remember along with globalization and international trade. So one of this is Interna international business. International business is defined as firms or businesses that engages in international economic activities. So you are not limited to your country, but outside of the country as well. And then other is multinational multinational enterprise or MNE. Some other books um, uses MNC, Multinational Corporation. But the book where I get this, um, actually the author is at the end of the, the slides, a discussion. Mm, they called it MNE. So MNE, Multinational Enterprise. And then, of course, Global Business. This is actually a recent concept used by authors and businesses, global business activities um, includes international activities covered by traditional international businesses, domestic activities, and such as responses of local firms to M&E and trends. So those are just a few terms that you need to Remember, and of course, another, another term that you should put in mind is that you're not anymore called branch managers. If you are one of the high rank officials in MNEs or MNCs, you can now be called international manager and you are engaged in international management. So international management is the process of applying management concepts and techniques in a multinational environment and adapting management practices to different econ econ economies, political and cultural contexts. That's why when, if you want to really excel in your business in the future or in your career in the future, you should not limit your understanding of businesses and cultures or even economies within the four corners of our country. Because if you really, really want to be recognized and be, excel in your area, you have to be good at international management as well. And then aside from international management, you also have international economics. So it's not anymore the economy of the Maguete or the economy of the Philippines, but international economics. This consists of issues raised by the special problems of economic interaction between sovereign states, so the state of the Philippines, um, another 
state here is not like the state in the United States, but state here defined as um, a country. The main theme of economic, international economics are the gains from trade, the patterns of trade, the protectionism, the balance of payment. If some of you are, are financial management major, you're, you're supposed to be familiar, familiar with balance of payments. And if you have, of course, um, if this is also discussed in your macroeconomic subject, balance of payments, because balance of payments is really important in identifying the wealth and economic condition of a country. And this also determines if an investor wants to invest in a certain country, they check the balance of payment of a country. Exchange rate determination, there are factors that considered to be in the exchange rate. International policy coordination and the international capital market. So please take note on that. And then, of course, the international business trade. So the most conventional forms of international business transaction are international trade and investment. International trade refers to an ex exchange of products and services across national borders through exporting or importing. And remember, guys, um, when you are talking about export and import, it's not only on manufactured products. We can also import and export services, just like how we export human capital to another country to provide them with health services, engineering services, and the likes. Okay? It's not only merchandise, but also manpower are being exported. So you might ask, why is it that businesses pursue international market as exporters or probably importers? The traditional explanation to this is that international trade has referred to comparative advantage. The superior features of a country, so if you get something from a country, if you or you send something to another country, typically derive from either natural endowments or deliberate national policies that provide it with unique benefits in global competition. That's why BPO companies are coming here, manufacturing companies are going to China, or some of our um, local business get their raw materials from other country because of comparative advantage and economies of scale act also. So Raymond Vernon from Harvard University developed the word international product life cycle. This is actually a dynamic theory to account for changes in the patterns of trade over time. The pattern suggests that change over time between two developed nations, other developed nations, and developing nations as production shift and the product's life cycle moves from new to maturing to standardized. So I think you're familiar with already with the, with the product life cycle. This was introduced to you with some other management subjects. So almost the same Raponisha as uh, Kaningi Soltini, Raymond Vernon, actually. So let's continue with the, with the, this um, diagram you can see in your screen. The foundation of international business. So international business, IB action, IB actors, and the IB system. So IB is international business. So who are doing the actions? Trading. So why do they go in? Businesses engage in international business and global globalizations and the likes. Like I said a while ago, because of comparative advantage. Next is competitive advantage. Investing, foreign direct investment, and eclectic paradigm. So when you're talking about foreign direct investment or FDI, these are multinational firms engaging business in another country. They do not only invest in terms of monetary, but they build businesses in 
that country. That's just like Nestle, Nestle Philippines, where in they really built their some of their plants, manufacturing plants in our country. So those are um, that is an example of an FDI. Um, Timex, we actually have a manufacturing firm of Timex in Cebu City in Mepsa, Mactan economic zone, Mactan, yes, MEPSA, processing economic zone. So we have that. Globalizing, markets and production. Um, a, a one, big, one big example of this is getting your market, not only from your country, is Jollibee. I've been using Jollibee for most of my example because Jollibee was a, is a Filipino-owned business. And then now, Jollibee is really, really getting famous around the globe, not only in the U.S., but also some part of Europe, wherein people are so curious about the chickens, chicken joy of Jollibee that they line up early in the morning. So market. They find market in another country and production, perhaps, in another country. So, and then in the actors, of course, the MNEs, or the MNC, the Multinational Enterprise, or the Multinational Corporation. SME is small and medium-sized enterprises. So they are the actors, the firms, the government, and the institution. So governments, trade and investment barriers, investment and other incentives. So these are actually um, the laws and regulation that protects not only the local businesses, but protects trade as a whole. So incentives and uh, another incentives and investment given to them. So actually, the economic zone we have in our country are are given special ha tax holidays to businesses who wants to engage in business in our country. Foreign investors, foreign investors. We actually have in our locality, like um, in Dumaguete, we have that the Robinsons area. That area is actually a they are given incentives to firms who engage in business, in trade, international, not local um, business. But locals are also encouraged also. Naapo na sila. Institutions, global institutions, intergovernment organizations, um, the GATT, the WTO, we'll discuss this later. The systems, the free trade agreement, economic integration, economic integration, we have this in the ASEAN integration. Um, another example of economic integration is the European Union. That's one. The free trade agreement to, for some countries where are the trade barriers are lowered. Foreign exchange and currency hedging. So this is part of the system, foreign, foreign exchange. Um, if you are actually earning dollars because someone is sending you, a family men member is sending you dollars, and then we are very, very happy that the dollar to peso exchange rate is very, very high. Like $1 is equivalent to, let's just say, 60 pesos. Actually, that is not good for our economy. If I am an international investor, I will have a second thought in investing in that country because the currency of that country is having a fever. Let's just use fever as a symptom. Because why? It means your currency is not competitive with that of another country. That's why dili po siya maayo. So maonang Dili tamalipay actually kung baling grabiha kalag ka mahal ang dollar to peso because this also means that mahal pud kayo mga palalito di ba So that's foreign exchange and then finance the monetary system and the financial market the monetary system of a a certain country and because different countries have different monetary systems and how they apply exchange rates and the inflations and the like, and control the inflation of each country. So the monetary system. So these three pillars of international business is vital to, to make international business and globalizations flow smoothly. 
even if there are challenges along the way. Okay, I hope you understand that. Now, there, these are the terms that you have to remember. I already defined international business. So these are the types of international businesses. So how you go, if you are a businessman and you want to engage in international transactions and international businesses, these are the things that you can do. It's either you import or export inflow and selling of goods from from and to home country from outside you can be licensing a standardized product with ownership rights can be distributed using licensing like um honda honda is not made in the philippines honda is a japanese product so those distributors licensed distributors actually accumulate a license from honda that they are qualified to sell honda Franchising, parent company gives right to other companies to carry on business in its name. So we have franchise business already in our country, um, international businesses, we have McDonald's, we have KFC. Well, we already have Starbucks in, in our locality. So those are franchising. That's part of international trade. Outsourcing and offshoring. So this, this is very familiar with you because of your subjects in BPO or SMP4 and SMP5. It means giving out the contract to an international firm for business, certain business purposes. So JVs and strategic partnership. It is an engagement between two companies, one being an international company to where the business has to be conducted. So it, somehow it's similar with outsourcing. Multinational companies, the companies that are Conducting business in more, in more than one country. Coca-Cola products, Pepsi products. They are conducting business to a lot of countries. Wow, now we have Minisu. That's a, I believe, a Korean or a Japanese um, originated product, um, business. And of course, like I said, I mentioned a while ago, a while ago is FDI or the foreign direct investment. So investment made by an individual or a company located in one country to the business interest located in another foreign country. So that's FDI. However, you are not going to be successful in doing business outside of your domain country or if you want to engage in business, international business, if you will not consider these factors in operating the business. First is geographical factors. When you are McDonald's and you want to establish a business in a Muslim country, you have also to consider the usual products and foods they are availing. And if you are McDonald's, you will realize that Muslims does not eat meat. So you have to let your product be qualified and certified as halal product, right? Social factors. There are countries that their um, certain colors, that part of their social factors that they do not like this or this is prohibited in their, this is not accepted in their social environment. So you have to also to consider that. And then again, legal policies. Um, in Singapore, you're not allowed to import chewing gum. If you are seen outside or in public chewing gum, you're actually being fine. You can Google it up actually. Somehow it is a, a somehow it is, I'm not sure, but somehow it is prohibited to chew gum in, in that country. And then behavioral factors. Ah, this one. Why is it that it's not related to international, but it's more related on behavioral factors? Have you wondered, guys, why there are more than 40, more than 40, almost 50 plus banks in Dumaguete City? Have you thought about that? Despite how small the city is, there are a lot of banks. 
branches, three, four branches of certain huge banks, top banks in the Philippines, and they have four, three branches within the city because the behavior of the people in Negros Oriental, because Dumaguete is our capital, right? Negros Oriental or within the near towns of Dumaguete, the behavior of the people are more conservative, meaning they are more on savings. They save. They are not spender. So their behavior is more on save. That's why banks flourish in our small city. And a number of banks, a huge number of banks is an economic indicator. The last factor is an economic indicator that this city is doing well. Because there are economic forces that drives that locality to have good business environment. If you are a businessman, you have to consider this. I'm giving an example, a local example, but it's the same concept if you want to engage business internationally and part and be part of the international market and international business, okay? I hope you get you get that. I know you get that. So these are the things that, that you should remember. I already mentioned um, some of this already, most of this actually. And then we now go to globalization or discuss globalization. Over the past three decades, a fundamental shift has been occurring in the world economy. We have been moving away from a world in which national economies were relatively self-contained entities, isolated from each other by barriers to cross-border trade and investment by investment, by distance, by time zones, and language, and by national differences in government regulation, culture, and business system. And we now we are moving toward a world in which barriers to cross-border trade and investment are declining. It's, this is true. Perceived distance is shrinking. Perceived distance is shrinking due to advances in transportation, telecommunication technology, material culture is starting to look similar all over the world because of internet, the televisions, and the like. And national economies are merging into a, an interdependent integrated global economic system. The process by which this is occurring is actually referred to as globalization. So globalization refers to the shift toward a more integrated and interdependent world economy. Globalization has different facets, including the globalization of market, and the globalization of production. So the globalization of markets refers to the merging of historically distinct and separate national markets into one huge global marketplace. Falling barriers to cross borders, cross border trade that have made it easier to sell internationally. Internationally, the presence of Amazon, the presence of Lazada, Shopee, Alibaba, this is, this is part of globalization. It breaks the barriers of cross-border trades and the likes. And we are experiencing it. It has been argued, however, for some time, that the taste and preference of consumers in different nations are beginning to converge. Hapit na magkapare-pareha. On the, on the on, sorry, on some global norm thereby helping to create a global market. Consumer products such as Citigroup credit cards, which is already present in our country, Coca-Cola soft drinks, Sony PlayStation. If, you, if you're familiar with Sony PlayStation, I've tried one, it's really, really good, guys. And you know how to really play like what games you have been taken, Marvel versus Capcom and the likes. It's really, it's really hype. 
McDonald's hamburger, Starbucks co coffee, or IKEA's furniture are frequently held up as a prototypical example of this trend wherein ang mga taste sa mga tao ba kanyang hapit na magkapari-pariha. Firms such as those I have mentioned cited uh, I have mentioned and cited are more than just benefactors of this trend. They are also facilitators of it by offering the same basic product worldwide. They help to create a global market. Actually, this is true. I have this friend in a friend who is a half Filipino, no, not half Filipino, a both a U.S. citizen and a Filipino citizen. Um, he mentioned that he 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 one time he ate at Jollibee and we asked him how does the taste of the burger in Jollibee in in the local in Dumaguete compared to that of the U.S. and he said it's just the same. It's just the same, and it's true. I went to uh, I went to Hong Kong. Um, way back, and we eat in Jollibee. That was not my choice, actually. You might, you might, you might be thinking, "Bali po si Mama, ini ano po lang lugar niya McDonald's kaya pagikan an yun aras atu, na aras dumagite na sa." It was um, someone bring us there, and they're the ones who give us. Um, it was free, so we're not supposed to reclamize. Because someone is giving us free food, a friend of a friend, so should it reclamo ta? And then of course they ordered for us. I ordered coffee and burger. And true, truth and behold, the burger in Hong Kong and the burger here in Dumaguete is just the same. Oh, di ba? So actually, these are stere um prototypical product example, and they are the ones driving. A globalized market of the same, the same taste. Starbucks. If you've been to Starbucks, actually, this ah, I've been to again Starbucks. The Starbucks here in Dubai and the Starbucks there in Hong Kong. I actually tried the Starbucks in Hong Kong because that was the first Starbucks I have tried. Charnas pates. Ano ra good pates pates ra good hanon ignon. Priya ra manggut. Priya ra siyang kapi. And even the price. I was actually one. I was actually thinking that I bought a. A souvenir mug, no mug tumbler. Sorry, not a mug. A tumbler. I asked the price of the tumbler in Hong Kong, and the price is just actually the same in the Philippines. Oh, de ba? You just have to convert. Okay, Hong Kong dollar yung peso. So ako ni convert convert. Pero yara man di ay. So actually, these are part of globalization, and these companies are actually the drivers also of globalization. So, the emergence of global institution. So, these are now, these are now um, the organizations that somehow um, regulates, regulates trades. So, as markets globalize and an increasing proportion of business activity transcends national borders, institutions are needed to help manage regulate and police the global market and to promote the establishment of multinational treaties to govern the global business system. Over the past century, a number of important global institutions have been created to help perform this function. So the, these three, the General Agreement on Tariff and Trade or GATT, we are actually include the Philippines is actually a member of this because we have been trading to with another with other countries. So GATT, the World Bank, and the International Monetary Fund, and of course the World Trade Organization. So most of their policies boils down to um, governing, establish to promote um hapsay nga pamaagi in trains because if no one governs and police one way or the other one country highly industrial country rich country might 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 take advantage of a poor country's um uh, resources and also they are also there to help in boosting the economy of some certain country just like world bank they are they are 
they are lending money to countries, to other countries to help boost the economy. So in, in addition to GATT, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the WTO, sorry, the, the United Nations also is included to this. United Nations was established to, on October 24, 1945, by 51 countries committed to preserving peace through international cooperation and collective security. According to the charter, the UN has four purposes. So these are also the purpose of the UN. To maintain international peace and security, to develop friendly relations among nations, to cooperate and in solving international problems, and in promoting respect for human rights, and to be a center for harmonizing the actions of nations. So here is another global institution, the G20TX. This is established on 1999. The G20 comprise, comprises the finance minister and central bank governors of, of the 19, what are they? I don't think we are included in this, 19 largest economies in the world. So please Google on the 19 countries. I don't know if we are included, but hopefully in the future. Plus, representative from the European Union and the European Central Bank. Originally established, to, no, so the G20 is originally established to formulate a coordinated policy response to financial crisis in developing nations. So developing nations, sure, you appeal na ni. Because there was a global financial crisis in 2008 and 2009, diba? so that's why this was also established. Um, in 2008 and 2009, it became the forum through which major nations attempted to launch a coordinated policy response to the global financial crisis that started in America and then rapidly spread around the world, ushering in the first serious global economic recession since 1981. So technically, 2008-2009, it was a global recession. It's not only America, but the whole world. So be familiar with this, with this um, institutions, uh, these organizations, okay? Because we are talking about international and business trade, and they are the organizations that police regulate and help manage the trade within nations. So the globalization of production. The globalization of production, a while ago, we globalization of market, now globalizations of production, refers to the sourcing of goods and services from location around the globe to take advantage of national differences in the cost, cost, cost and quality of factors of production. So what are the factors of production? You sh This should be, have been embedded in your psyche already, guys, because this is... Always, this is part in your basic economic, in your economic, labor, energy, land, and capital. So these are the basic factors of production. By doing this, companies hope to lower their overall cost structure or improve the quality or functionality of their product offering, product offering, thereby allowing them to compete more effectively. Um, an example. Uh, do you have bench? products if you do and you have it right now wherever you are if you're at your home if you have one in your home try looking at their tags some branch products are not actually made in the philippines anymore it's made in china because globalization of production Perhaps the labor, energy, and capital in China is lower compared to that in the Philippines. Okay? So these are the globalization of production actually happens. Nike, some of the, the irony is that Nike, some of its um, pro products are produced in Vietnam, but it does not mean it's a poor quality because the process, the materials, and the quality output are still there. It's just that if I if Nike produces some of their products in Vietnam, it means the factors of production in Vietnam 
is lesser or cheaper. So here you can see actually in your light, I don't know if it's a left side or right side of your screen, but this one, this one, this is Apple phone suppliers list. I got this from this, from this um, website. Look at the, the countries. This is just actually part, guys. This is just actually part. The list was actually long. But I, I, akong gito yung kanikanay. Philippines, Philippines, look. Samsung, elect, they outsource their product in Samsung. We have actually an FD, FDI. The, one of its FDI is located in Laguna, Philippines. Look, Samsung Electromechanic Company Limited. One of its, one of its, um, uh, businesses is located in the Philippines, Laguna, Philippines. And Samsung, Samsung, Samsung is from Korea. So mainland China, mainland China. And Samsung outsource some of their products in China. And Samsung have productions in China, in Thailand, in South Korea. Oh, there's a Vietnam or Seoul Semiconductor Company. So technically, if you are up, your cell phone is an Apple, so app is Apple or your laptop is Apple, they outsource some of their parts from various countries. And chain reaction siya ba? Si, Sam, si Apple ni outsource ni Samsung. Diba? Yung si Samsung po, nag-create o production niya wala sa Korea, dito sa Pilipinas. Oh, diba? So that's, um, that's somehow the beauty of globalization. And that's why this company globalized or enter in the global market because of economies of scale. So, mo siyang resulta na to karun. And besides uh, this one, the white side, where in one company outsource, outsource parts and parcel of each, either software or hardware. And then this actually, you can, rem you can um, probably relate this to your SMP4. SMP4, Business Process Outsourcing 1, wherein they, they outsource product or manufacture some of their product to another country, but they do not outsource part of their activities if it is their core activities. These are probably non-core activities. Part of Samsung by Selen Science and Technology Company Limited by Shell Semiconductor Company Limited and Samsung. They outsource some of their production because of um, economies of scales and cheaper factors of production. So these are all, now we go to the drivers of globalization. So the drivers of globalization is actually declining trade, investment barriers, barriers, and technological trades. So international trade occur. So international trade occur occurs when a firm exports goods or services to the consumer in another country. So that, na na siya. FDI occurs when a firm, I think I already discussed this, so I'm not going to elaborate that. Third is in um, technological change has made it a tangible reality since the end of World War II. The world has seen major advances in communication, information, process, transport. The World Wide Web, the internet has flattened the world. Now we are able to know what's happening in China, in, in the US, in France, some part of the Europe and the like. And then we have now bullet, we don't have bullet train in our country, but we have airplane, we have trains in, in Luzon. There are already uh, the PNR that lessens the number of hours traveling from, from the high city to the provinces. So these are the drivers of globalization. So technological change, so the, the invention of microprocessors. Microprocessors is sa una pamani. We have seen already in, in the television, especially Avengers, the nanotechnology, wherein they regenerate. Oh, di ba? Na naman na siya actually karon. Dili pa siguro dre sa atua, or na naman siguro. Dili pa inana ka famous kay mahal siya the internet and the world wide web you already know this 
transportation technology. We have already um, smart cars. Uh, sana's all smart. Implication for the globalization of production. Implication for the globalization of markets. This, is, this has already been discussed. And then changing demographics. m and is in any business that is produced. Ah, sorry. Productive activities in two or more countries. So m and is and then since 1960s, two notable trends in the demographic of the multinational enterprise have been first is the non-US multinational. And the rise of mini multinational. So the non-US multinationals are those businesses engaging in FDIs in the US. So Jalibe, non-US multinational, nag engage of business did to sa, sa US. So non-US multinational. Um, what else? If there is a Volkswagen manufacturing firm in the US, um, I'm not sure, but perhaps if, I'll give you an example. If na, uh, so that is what you call a non-US multinationals engaging in business in the US. And then another trend in international business has been has been the growth of medium size and small and small multinational multinationals. So, an examples are Exxon, G, GM, General Motors, Ford, Fuji, Kodak, Procter and Gamble, Sony, Unilever. Although most international trade and investment is still conducted by large, medium size, and small businesses, are becoming increasingly involved in international trade and investment. The rise of the internet is lowering the small firms face uh, in the building international. Why is it that um, the rise of internet has has lessened the barriers? Actually, kanang mag order order taglazada or shopping yung atong mga products gikan sa laing country, de ba? Those those businesses in another country does not need to put business in the Philippines just to have sells just to sell their product in our country we just use an app we just use an intermediary either lazada shopee amazon alibaba this platform has become a middleman for for products in our country and products from another country to have trade changing demographics that's part of the global economy and trade so the global economy of the 20th century. So the volume of cross-border trade and investment has been growing more rapidly than global output, indicating that national economies are becoming more closely integrated into a single interdependent global economic system. I think I already mentioned this. The move toward the global economy has been further strengthened by the widespread adoption of liberal economic policies by countries that had firmly opposed them for two generations is more. So in this, keeping with the normative per prescription of liber liberal economic ideology in country after country, we have seen, we have seen actually and observed that state-owned business are privatized. Um, we have experienced this. There are there are negative implications to this and positive implications um, actually of state-owned businesses that has been privatized. PNB, P Philippine National Bank, was actually owned by the Philippine government. Um, a gasoline station. I don't. I don't know. Please Google it up for verification. Um, Petron or fuel oil. We have one gasoline station that is that was owned by the Philippine government and was sold. Um, PNOC was owned by the Philippine government but was sold during. Uh, the previous presidents, previous presidents, kana kung Petron by previous president, mga, mga, nga, nga karaan nga mga presidente, kana si lagi pang baligya, GOCCs, mga government owned control corporations that are being sold, the mga inana. There are good things and bad things about this, but anyway, before they have sold this, privatized this product, they have probably have a study about this or there must be something really, really vital na nung kinahalan nila ibaligya. But anyways, 
um, that is uh, part of the global economy of the 20th century. However, maskin pag unsa kanindot ng globalization, naagoy po yung mga anti-globalization. So I'll give you an example of anti-globalization protest sa McDonald in France. Activists destroyed a McDonald restaurant in August 1999 to, pro to protest the impoverishment of French culture by American imperialism. While violent protests may give an anti-globalization effort a bad name, it is clear from the scale of the demonstration that support for the cause goes beyond a core of anarchists. So, grabe kayo sila, marag nang gubat yun silang tindahan ba? Okay, probably that was the first time that, that McDonald was established in, in France during that time. And some people are against it. Actually, during our this time around, um, during the pandemic, there are those that anti-vaxxers. I'm not, I don't, um, I don't condemn them, but sometimes they go beyond, like, manakit na sila og tao. That is actually not good. Okay, pasakit na ba? And then, that's another human, mo pwede yung pasakitan. So, kung nang hindi siya maayo. The same with the anti-globalization protest that happens here, wherein they really destroy the store. And, what if there are lives or people there? So, madaot siya. Inana ba? So globalization, jobs, and income. One concern frequently voiced by globalization opponents is that falling barriers to international to destroy manufacturing jobs in wealthy advanced economies such as the United States or the Western Union, Western Europe. The critics argue that falling trade barriers allow firms to move manufacturing activities to countries where wage rates are much, much lower. Indeed, due to the entry of China, about na si China and India, and state from Eastern Europe into the global trading system, along with the global population growth, estimates suggest that the pool, pool, P -O -O -L, pool of global labor may have quadrupled between 1985 and 2005, with most of the increase occurring after 1990s. Other things being equal, one might conclude that this enormous expansion in the global labor, labor force when coupled with expanding international trade, would have depressed wages in developed nations. So um, they, those antis thinks that if, like, dinan ni mapunggan, it's already happening, but during that time, nga, sige pa sila, koan. Um, makuan man good nga, like, US is outsourcing their call center in our Philippines or India. So wala na sila ay may empleyado. Did tumurag inana ba? Muna siyang, Ang income sa ilang nasod, ang income sa mga tao, wala na sa trabaho, makaunaw na sa silang inana. Which is, hindi po mo sila ma-blame ma kay trabaho ba yan? Mawal ang trabaho, lalim ba? So, globalization, labor policies, and the environment. Supporters of free trade and greater globalization express doubts about this scenario. They argue that tougher environment regulations and stricter labor standards go hand-in-hand -hand with economic progress. In general, as countries get richer, they in act tougher environmental and labor regulation because free environment and labor laws. Labor laws. In this view, the critics of free trade have got it backward. Free trade does not lead to more pollution and labor exploitation. It leads to less by creating wealth and incentive to enterprises to produce technological, technological innovation. The free market system and free trade could make it easier for the world to cope with pollution and population growth. In indeed, when pollution levels are rising in the world's poorer countries, they have been falling in developed nations. Actually, when globalization and industrialization, before globalization, industrialization actually occurred before, and there are a lot of critics about it, and greenhouse gases and greenhouse effects of pollutions and combustions from, from manufacturing firms that uses um, non-renewable source of energy like coal, mga inana. But karon higa hinahine na biya po nahuna ang mga, mga businesses like um, sustainable energy, clean energy. That's why cars are, kapantay mo mga bagong mga cars, wala na kayo katong murag aso nga po, di ka mawalas aso. So ginahine na silang inana kay para efficient, effective, clean energy na siya, fuel savings. Um, we already have solar solar energy sources of electricity from solar energy. 
our in our province our source is actually, is actually from the nature nga dili siya ina naka pollution uh, makahatag pollution the geothermal energy we have the wind energy in the philippines i think in ilocos where the marcoses thing but ako di ko ka memorize the place basta kabalo ko sa marcoses sa ilocos man siguro na siya and then what else the maria cristina falls na water uh, water source of energy and there are already cars that uses electricity instead of fuels a gasolina um there are already cars nga kana ganing mga hybrid cars nga gasolina o electricity o di ba so and then buildings in singapore and in japan na required nga dapat na somewhere green so wala naman sila yuta na sa taas silang building so people are moving to that and if you're familiar with Kyoto Protocol or have heard of Kyoto Protocol where in companies, um, nations are encouraged to um, lessen their carbon carbon footprint on the planet. Okay, and then we're encouraged to plant trees and the likes. So actually, this is good. And somehow, part of globalization, I'm going to say something I give up. So mo na ay mga, mga oppositions to globalizations because di po sila ganahan nga madaot ang kalibutan and the likes. So that ends my discussion in part one of um, our subject. So these are the references. Thank you and have a good day.